Hi, my name is Lindsay Unger. Uh, as Jean mentioned, I've been uh, living in Jackson for almost 10 years now, actually. Um, I uh, originally was a civil engineer, and then when I moved there, it was kind of a bad time with the housing market turning, and I ended up starting working for SkyWest Airlines. And I've been working there for almost 10 years and got really into traveling, personally. And uh, I like to go to places that I know nothing about, so one year I decided uh, I should go to Uzbekistan. And knew nothing about it, and actually it's kind of funny how I ended up at University of Wyoming because, you know, uh, do you know Mark Jenkins? I don't know if anyone's seen him come through here yet. He does the What in the World presentations himself, so he was doing a presentation on Uzbekistan and the, well, and the first skiers in Central Asia, so I thought, well, I should go and see this, but I got there late because I was going the next morning to Mexico to meet someone else, um, and it was sold out. And so I actually hung out in the lobby where they had a booth set up on the uh, University of Wyoming Global and Area Studies program, and afterwards I met Dave and Jean and decided, well, um, this sounds interesting, I might as well give it a shot. So here I am, two years later, having done my field work in Central Asia and being part of the program, presenting it myself. So. Uh, uh, like Jean said, I studied the community-based ecotourism industry in Kyrgyzstan. Um, I initially was in Kyrgyzstan as part of my Uzbekistan trip in 2014 and um, tried out the community-based tourism network myself, so I decided to go back and study it to see how well it was doing um, as promoting tourism on a local level in Kyrgyzstan. So my main research question was how is community-based tourism working as a means of sustainable development and environmental conservation um, within local, national, and um, global sustainable development goals. So Kyrgyzstan, as I mentioned, is in Central Asia. It's a former Soviet country. Uh, it's relatively poor. Uh, approximately one-third of the population still lives uh, below the poverty line in Kyrgyzstan. And, um, Compared to the rest of Central Asia, uh, they don't have quite as many uh, natural resources in the form of oil or natural gas, but what they do have is, uh, are really beautiful mountains. So 95% of the country is covered with mountains. Uh, it's a big headwater for uh, water resources, and so it's become a little bit more of a geopolitical centerpiece these days in terms of water rights. And so Kyrgyzstan was really looking to take advantage of their natural resources in the form of pristine, beautiful uh, mountains, and um, to use uh, tourism as a way to make money off of that resource. So it's about um, three quarters the size of Wyoming, but there's almost six million people um, in the country. And it's been called the Switzerland of Central Asia, in part because of their mountains, and also because they followed a distinctly uh, democratic free market development path compared to other um, countries in Central Asia. Not a lot of tourists are going there now, uh, this is me, in, on a mountain bike tour, uh, um, from the United States, but it is more and more popular with Europeans and was recently ranked the number one emerging tourism destination by the UK's Business Insider. I just want to do a brief background on the tourism industry. Uh, it is one of the largest industries in the world and it's becoming more and more important, especially as a means of development in um, um, emerging destinations. 1.1 billion international tourists were recorded in the year 2015, and the United Nations declared 2017 as the International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development. So it is becoming more important in the development industry as well. So when I talk about sustainable development, there's um, hundreds of definitions that go around, but I like to use a very simple one um, from the Brentland Report in 1987, which is development that meets the needs of the present, gener uh, present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, and by doing so, encompassing economic, social, and environmental components of development. Um, to give you an idea, like I mentioned, about the national and international development goals, um, so Kyrgyzstan recently came out with, in 2013, a national sustainable development agenda. Uh, they went through a lot of political turmoil in the 90s and the 2000s with a few political revolutions, uh, so the government uh, was pretty new as of 2010, and they decided to follow a, a somewhat radically different development path with their sustainable development um, agenda. The United Nations, uh, meanwhile, just came out with the sustainable development goals, which are meant to replace the Millennium Development Goals, which went from 2000 to 2015. So the sustainable development goals are to be in place between 2016 and 2030, and there's um, 17 goals with 169 targets, Three of the 17 goals include sustainable tourism 
as a specific metric that they're trying to um, both use as a means and uh, a method of achieving these goals. And just to give you an idea, so these are a couple pictures from Kyrgyzstan. This one I did not take, but this is Skeen and Arslanbab, which is the village I studied. And uh, this one is a picture of the walnut forest, which I'll discuss shortly. So community-based tourism in Kyrgyzstan, it actually began in the year 2000 with help from Helvetas, which is the Swiss development organization. Community-based tourism uh, basically means that local residents uh, take a large part in the management and the ownership of the tourism. So as opposed to having maybe a, um, a Hilton come in that brings in a lot of their own food, their own building design, uh, maybe some of their own employees, community-based tourism is meant to involve the community on a much uh, more intricate level. Some of the activities that they'll do is put out massive food spreads like this. Um, these two people own a homestay, so it's almost like a small bed and breakfast that they have running right out of their homes. You have a lot of connection with the local people. And then here are uh, three guides that are on horseback, and actually in that picture we're going to a backcountry ski hut to get it prepared for the winter. Um, and now it started in one village, but now it's independently operated in 15 different villages throughout Kyrgyzstan. So for my research, I was, um, I was in, in Kyrgyzstan from September through December of 2015. Um, I was looking, like I said, at the local, national, and global policy, and I conducted over 40 interviews with different stakeholders in the tourism industry. So um, I spent one month in Arslanbab uh, discussing their uh, local level um, CBT program, and then I also talked with the executive director of the national CBT. I spoke with some uh, members from the United Nations on their development. I also spoke with uh, academics in the tourism industry, forestry officials on the national and local level, and uh, people who actually weren't involved with CBT to see what their opinions were. To get a little comparison, I also was able to go to Tajikistan to see their very nascent community-based tourism industry for about a week, and I went to three other locations within Kyrgyzstan to uh, compare Arslanbab to their location. So this is a picture of Arslanbab. It's a town of about 14,000 people, and this is where I did my case study. Uh, I chose this location uh, in part because it is surrounded by the world's largest walnut forest at 42 square miles. And so I wanted to see how the uh, international tourism that had started to come to Arslanbab was affecting the way that people interacted with the walnut forest. And so I chose uh, October because this is around the time when the walnut harvest takes place. It's a really fun time of year. Um, People have traditionally earned a lot of income from walnut harvesting, and so it's kind of like a big community party. Uh, unfortunately, this is actually what happened when I got there. So being in the mountains, the weather is really unpredictable, and uh, it snowed several feet over the course of three and a half weeks. Um, so this area here is where there's a tourist attraction called a small waterfall that's usually filled with a lot of people, but it was closed down. Um, that is a sink that was not f flowing with any water. Um, and then this is a little place that I was staying at one of the homestays where they typically are drying the walnuts. Um, the snow did melt enough for me to do some walnut harvesting, so just to give you somewhat of an idea how this works, in that picture there actually is a walnut, and this is how you get it. Okay, it's right there. <laughs> Too slow. Um, and then I picked a very small bag of walnuts, and then it, once you have a lot of people involved, it gets to be many, many tons of walnuts. This was uh, one of the worst harvests that Arslanbab has had in decades this year, uh, because they had a very snowy spring, and so they knew it was going to be a poor harvest. So I thought this was going to be a problem, but it actually turned out to be really interesting in terms of my findings. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, this is the only other picture that I didn't take, but my friend took that um, in Arslanbab, and I just love that donkey. <laughs> so, like I was mentioning with the walnut harvest, it was a terrible year. Um, however, one of the things I found was that people in Arslanbab have many, many different ways of earning income. So, uh, a phrase that often was repeated to me was, 40 jobs is not enough for a young man in Arslanbab. Right? So they expect the young men to be uh, farmers and harvesters and mechanics and salesmen um, and and uh, carpenters and to basically do everything. So I thought it would be a problem with the walnut harvest, but what they said was, oh no, this is natural, this happens. We have other ways of making money, we'll make up for it in different ways. So um, in terms of how tourism has an impact, 
Uh, tourism, in, in many ways, is an additional source of income for people in Arslanbab. Uh, for only two people is tourism their only source of income. But traditionally, there's been a lot of domestic tourists, and so they're used to a seasonal domestic tourism pattern. So what I found was the international tourists um, actually supplemented the income, but in a way that was a little bit healthier. Um, one of my topics I looked at for desk research was about sustainable rural, rural livelihoods. And so the idea is that um, people are, are going to be okay if they have a diversification <coughs> strategy. With a lot of times, people in small towns, at least in Kyrgyzstan and Arslanbab, they're used to relying on natural resources and they're used to um, natural resources varying over the years. So uh, it actually works out in, in their benefit to have an additional source of income that they're not relying on entirely. Uh, in terms of the environmental impact, uh, the picture I had here, it's actually similar to this donkey, uh, where I was going on the mountain bike tour is going through the walnut forest. So even when it's a bad harvest year, tourism is still able to happen in terms of mountain biking, horseback riding, camping in the forest. So it's another method of stabilizing the income. Um, but like I said, it's just a piece of the puzzle. So another thing that is really important in Arslanbab is remittances. So in Kyrgyzstan, it's one of the largest remittance economies in the world. And um, upwards of 25% of the households in Kyrgyzstan have at least one family member who's working abroad, usually in Russia. So what I found in Arslanbab is that um, many of the young men were actually choosing to stay and work uh, in the tourism industry in the summer as opposed to going to Russia. Now, like I say, it's a piece of the puzzle. Part of the reason they're doing that is because the ruble was dropping, and so they weren't able to make as much money as they previously had. So there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle, but tourism is becoming more and more an important part. Uh, this, I just love this picture. So these are um, iron ice, ice skates, they call them. Are some of them very traditional. They love their um, traditional dress and also um, apparatus like this, so um, they do have more newer modern skis, but they still love to have their old hundred year old snowshoes and, and wooden skis as well. So another interesting, there's so many things to talk about with tourism, but um, another interesting piece there. In terms of national and global findings, um, as I mentioned, I was looking at the national and international level as well, because I wanted to see how this local destination fit into <coughs> the, the greater picture. So the National Sustainable Development Strategy um, turned out to be not quite as great as it sounded in terms of it was written but never adopted is what many people called it because uh, the um, departments that were suggested were never actually funded. So they didn't actually happen. So what a lot of people said was it looks great on paper, our government's great on paper, but uh, implementation just, it, it's not quite there yet. Um, the National Tourism Department has a budget of about $70,000, which includes salaries for seven people and the entire uh, marketing and um, festival budget for the entire year. It was extremely weak. The uh, director of the Tourism Department was actually in jail the entire time I was in the country. Um, <laughs> corruption is a huge problem as well. So uh, <laughs> when you look at the, uh, I, uh, I was actually looking at a private-public partnership idea. It wasn't working. Um, there's a lot of mistrust, distrust. Uh, around on the community and the national level with the governments. Um, I won't get into this too much, but uh, CBT was actually changing from being um, a development funded organization by Helvetus to an independently operated self sufficient organization. Um, this was supposed to be great in terms of long term sustainability. However, they still had some development ties, and so a lot of the other actors in the tourism industry were not happy about this and didn't like the politics that were involved and felt that it was unfair and disrupting the free market. So there's many, many different avenues going on here. Um, so I'll talk more about in my 100 some page thesis. Um, so on the left here is, uh, just I want to give you an idea of these pictures. On the left, that's a picture of the national flag of Pakistan. <coughs> So on my first day in the country, I did a hike up to the top of a mountain. It was actually kind of a little race with a domestic tourist, and someone had gotten up there first and planted this flag. Okay, there was a huge snowstorm going on. It was extremely windy. I don't even know how the flag was still there 20 minutes later. There's no way it was going to last another hour. So there is, to me, this was representative of, of what's happening in Kyrgyzstan on a national pride level. People have a lot of pride in their country to the point where they're going to take this flag with them and plant it. However, the implementation, that flag is going to be gone. You know, it's not um, necessarily well thought out, but the idea is there in the, in the first place. On the bottom here, I'm talking about um, the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Here's a picture of uh, a billboard that actually describes the, national, or the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, 
in Russian. Um, however, it's placed on a back street in the middle of Bishkek, which is the capital, and it's almost completely encompassed by trees at this point. So unless you're walking very slowly and right underneath it like I was, most people aren't going to see that. So again, the idea is there, uh, but in terms of how effective is it, it's a little bit low. Uh, when I spoke with the members of the United Nations, uh, the development program, they were really excited that I was there to talk about community tourism. They said, this is fantastic. This is exactly what we want for the Sustainable Development Goals. I said, that's awesome. So, so what kind of projects do you have? And they said, we love this idea. <laughs> okay, good. So um, it's also not quite there yet, but I'm hoping that we'll get there. Uh, and so my project ended up focusing a lot more on, on the local level to see how effective the tourism uh, industry was while I was there. I want to tie this back just a little bit to Wyoming. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been in Jackson for quite some time. I've seen a lot of the um, trials and tribulations of a tourist town that has extremely high levels of tourists coming in. Uh, some some uh, aspects are positive and some are definitely negative. Um, this is a picture of Arslanbad. I mean, it almost looks like Mount Moran from the north. So I just think it's it's an interesting dynamic that we have where I think we can learn from each other. I think there's a lot that we can do to help Kyrgyzstan develop their tourism industry from this beginning standpoint uh, in a responsible way so that they are conscious of what might be happening. Because most people I talked to and I said, what do you want to see this look like? They said, we just need more tourists. I said, oh, you, you know, sometimes that's not always the answer, you know. So um, at this point, that's what they're looking for. But I'm, I'm uh, interested in trying to help not just in Kyrgyzstan, but in, in developing emerging destinations around the world, help people understand what the future might look like, look at scenario planning, and try to help them be more involved in the decision making of what will progress. So um, I did want to take one more opportunity to thank everyone, actually, uh, especially from the Centennial Fellowship, uh, the opportunity to do this research. I don't know if I would have had it anywhere else, actually. Um, and it was really amazing to spend this amount of time. Like I said, I was there for almost three months. Um, and it's just something I really want to do. So to be able to do that and learn so much along the way um, through my coursework as well with the support of people who are extremely interested and experts in this area, like Professor Kemp I mean, at University of Wyoming was just uh, an amazing opportunity. So thank you very much for everyone's support in that endeavor. I think that's it.